Well, good morning, Meng. Um, thank you so much uh, to our esteemed guests at Music Exchange 2023. Um, we introduce Meng Ru Kuok. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, um, you are a, I'm going to introduce you just uh, for those who do not know you, but by the, the end of the session, I think they'll be very familiar with uh, who you are and what your and your ambitions uh, within the greater music space. But uh, you are a Singaporean entrepreneur and the group CEO and founder of Caldecott Music Group, um, a global music industry in investor and innovator that spans a number of sectors, including digital, which is band lab technologies, uh, media, which is enemy, which we'll get into a bit later. I'm very curious about that and manufacturing and retail um, through your Vista Musical Instruments uh, group. And um, you set the overall direction and lead the product strategy for these groups. Um, so yes, you clearly have uh, very much a, uh, an entrepreneurial, but also a, a very, very strong musical uh, uh, connection, which um, I'm curious about, because you could have gone into any sector, you could have gone into oil, you could have gone, on, gone into renewables, you could have got into <laughs> tech, but you are in tech, obviously, through BandLab. But yeah, um, tell us a little bit more about that motivation to get into the space that you find yourself in very successfully. Thanks so much, Jason. And really, really nice to meet you and great to connect. And once again, to everybody uh, at the Music Exchange Conference, I'm, I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there today. I really wanted to be there. I promised Martin that I would be. Uh, and and ex, you know, extraneous circumstances made it impossible. But really, um, very, very fortunate to be in an industry that I, I love and, and know personally, both as a user, but also now as an operator. Um, I got involved in the industry what I call the industry and the musical instruments industry actually more than 10 years ago now. So back in 2012, through the acquisition of a company called Sui Li, which is a retailer distributor at the time, mostly a distribution company of most of the major music instrument brands. So today we represent about 129 different brands, 130 brands from everything from Fender to Taylor to PRS to Martin to all the musical instruments uh, that one needs in their journey. Um, and out of that spun our other businesses and the other parts of the musical instrument chain, everything from BandLab Technologies, which I co-founded, to Enemy Networks, uh, which I didn't found, but Enemy, obviously an incredible brand that was founded in 1952 in the UK in London. So from the music space, think of what we do at Caldecott Music Group, really end to end, everything from creators all the way to consumers, you know, creation to consumption, and that really is what I would say is the intersection that's most exciting to us today and what really BandLab is the center of, that transition and that intersection between mass music consumption all the way into mass music creation. Uh, and it's a very, very interesting time where there's so much change happening in the industry um, for good and some some ethical challenges as well with the adoption and the, the growth of generative AI. Mm, I think you've actually just uh, nailed that first question because uh, we were going to ask you around the changes um, in the music industry. Obviously, BandLab uh, was started in 2015 um, and uh, would you know, dial it forward. It's nearly 10 years later. Um, how, how have you seen the music industry evolve in that period? Well, interestingly, the music industry is actually very, very similar. I think a lot of the evolution has really come from, you know, most of the evolution in the space has really come from what we've been doing. So um, if you think about the innovations that had happened in music, uh, the big innovation that had happened that pushed what we think of as the modern music generation or the generation of music software that exists today was very much that transition from physical products to digital products in the world of music. But I think one of the biggest changes that we've seen, especially as you've had more tools and services and power emerging musicians and people who, again, largely were empowered by a desktop or a laptop ecosystem to music, musically create and express themselves, you've seen that change and that shift of music going from becoming a, you know, from being a product and reverting to being a service. I say reverting to being a service because if you think about it, Prior to the biggest innovation in music uh, in, in, you know, in the last couple of hundred years, the, in the invention of the phonograph, everything was live music largely with a little bit of notation as the product and music was largely a service for a short period of time. It became huge as a product, was distributed around the world, created immense value for people in the channel as well as creators and IP. But today it's very much reverting to being back to being a service 
because of some of the disruption that's out there in terms of digital. So actually on the consumption side, with the rise of platforms like Spotify, you haven't necessarily seen a huge change in the last 10 years, but actually where you've seen that seismic shift and what you know we're very proud to be at the front of the wave for is really this change and the systemic shift and the idea that mobile music creation is really the future, the idea that mass music creation can be accessible to everybody. And that's a key reason I was very excited to be in South Africa. It's one of our biggest territories in, on the African uh, continent. And, and, and the amount of talent and sheer musicality that's out there on, on the continent is absolutely incredible, but largely underserved because if you don't own a laptop or you don't own an iPhone, there are no tools for you to make music free and accessible, let alone getting into next generation software that's mobile or cloud first. Yes, which then brings us to to BandLab because obviously that that's where um, you you became aware of the disconnect uh, between um, arguably speaking the first world and you know the rest of the world where um, there was this huge pool of talent. Uh, but yet there were there was no access to be able to to uh, present that and to share it, uh, and and was that the ethos and the and the thinking behind creating BandLab when you did? Yeah, very much. I, I would say you know even in the first world there was a lack of innovation in the music creation space. When you think about the parallel on the creation side, let's say the DAW and our entire creation ecosystem, the, effectively the G suite of music creation tools that we have all built into BandLab. There wasn't, there wasn't a G suite of music creation. There was very much only the traditional um, desktop-based DAWs. And if you think of the analogy of BandLab to GarageBand or BandLab to FL or Ableton and software like that, or Pro Tools, uh, which which more people will be familiar with from the traditional industry, it's really the it's the comparison between BandLab and GarageBand is similar to Google Docs and Microsoft Word or Sheets to Excel or Canva to Photoshop. Really next generation software largely empowered by the cloud versus desktop based internet hard drive uh, you know offline software then you also have the systemic shift and the seismic shift of going from laptop to mobile and that's something we felt very very strongly about i personally felt strongly about was the idea that just creating a browser or another desktop cloud version of a music creation tool was not enough and coming from Southeast Asia and seeing the growth and the penetration of mobile usage that was very different to West and first world countries in terms of laptop usage. And you saw the proliferation and the leapfrogging of these devices with mobile. It was inevitable that mobile as a platform and as a surface for music creation was inevitable. I think that was always going to happen. But what also additionally was particularly exciting to me and why really I was motivated to be part of, of founding BandLab was the idea that music making is not just about the tools. And this is something that I had a front row seat to. People coming in to buy their very first guitar in a music store wasn't just about buying the most expensive guitar, wasn't just about the idea of becoming someone very, very famous. And the journey wasn't just about buying the most expensive guitar. Someone who came in and bought a $5,000 guitar didn't mean that they came out a $5,000 play immediately. You had to actually learn the instrument. You had to play yeah. it till your fingers. Word. And playing music is more than just the tools. It's also about your parents supporting you. It's about your friends liking what you play or getting that inherent feedback and community of people who you start to interact with. And so with something like BandLab and innovating on the music creation process, what was particularly exciting to me and was part of the founding vision was this idea that music making is more than just the tools. And you need community. You need feedback. It's inherently collaborative. And that really is where cloud and mobile comes into play all in this beautiful um, uh, ecosystem of where you have creation and social in the same place. And that second generation social network, social community was, was uh, I'm very fortunate that all the interviews I did back in 2015, 16 onwards were all about the same thing, creation and community in one place um, and content, the three C's, creation, you know, content, commerce and community in one place. And also the idea that everybody was able to do this together and, and actually build a community out of that, that, is more relevant than ever before in 2023. Absolutely, and I think you know, obviously, if if one looks at the last couple of years, um, it, um, it certainly through through the pandemic, it must have been um, a really interesting time for you to watch how people who you know were were desperate for community 
but also in a very creative space because they had capacity, they had time to do that. Um, so I'm sure through through your journey over the last couple of years, Band Lab has seen um, even even a greater growth than you would have anticipated because of uh, just what was happening in the world. Yeah, I, I think um, you know we'd always seen extremely strong numbers. I think we're one of the only platforms that post COVID on a creation perspective has grown even more aggressively. Actually, you know, last month was our biggest month ever in terms of new users. Um, and a lot of that largely was from the fact that we weren't necessarily just a replacement. We weren't just a virtualized environment that was a replacement for the existing process. In fact, what COVID was supportive of in the, in the mindset, I would say, of more traditional users was the idea that they were willing to try something different. For example, getting on a Zoom or getting on a Google Meet. Um, but I guess this is proof that in the past, it wouldn't have been possible to actually be able to do something remotely um, when, when circumstances didn't permit. But even post environment, when I was planning to be in, in South Africa in Cape Town with you guys, um, it's actually still possible to interact and utilize the tools to still make it possible. So I think the idea that this is not a replacement for very much a new part of the workflow and the process. And for many, many, in fact, you know, 90%, 95% of our users, this is their very first workflow in making music and then native to it. And that really is something that we think is very exciting for the future because we're just going to continue building on the creation features and, and the users, as you can see from the success that you're seeing from some of them on the charts, getting signed by major labels, incredible stories out of Africa in, you know, India, all around the world, but particularly the U S um, it all comes from a new generation of creators and, and, you know, two thirds of our audience is under the age of 24. That's really an exciting demographic of people who are out there learning and engaging and making music. And and clearly you you know you have your ear to the ground and I think the the evolution of Band Lab has come from the very creators who are using it um, to the point that you've you've incorporated so much of that feedback um, and it you, you talk about democratizing music but you've also <clears throat> um, made Band Lab um, the people's it, it it belongs to everyone in the sense that they've informed. Um, how it's how it's evolving. Would would you agree with that statement? Oh, I, I think so. Absolutely. I think any product or any brand or company in 2023, it, again, industries have changed. Products have changed. No longer can you just sit in a corner or in a room and just develop in isolation and just with the ideas that you guys have. I think today more than important, more, more than ever before, especially because music is collaborative. I believe companies should be collaborative as well, whether it's with your community or with other companies in the space. Um, that that's a core part of taking feedback and understanding what our community actually wants. You know, we're very lucky that we actually have those voices um, versus other products that maybe don't have the same interaction or sit in a different position with their users. Um, that's that's only helpful because you have suddenly you know, millions and millions of additional product people around the world and, and all who see a different side of the planet that, that you could possibly see on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. and, and where would you say is your, is, is your biggest market? I mean, um, with regards to the use of BandLab and the success of BandLab? A use of BandLab, by a long way, our biggest market is the U.S. You know, about a third of our audience is in the U.S. Um, and other territories are, are, you know, relatively large, but still largely single digits in terms of percentage of the user base, even for the biggest. Um, but U.S. Mm. is the biggest by a long way. Um, and, and we're extremely excited by that and very proud, despite being based here in, in little Singapore, uh, we've been able to do this and create a global product, but also one that's in, um, you know, seeing tremendous success in one of the biggest markets in the world. And <clears throat> obviously, uh, the world of music is vast uh, from a genre perspective. Where do you you know, where would you say your big, your biggest success is coming from? Because obviously you've got creatives from, from all spheres creating different styles of music. Um, obviously they're looking to attract a global audience, but uh, where are you seeing those niche music genres coming to the fore that you hadn't necessarily seen before? So I think one of the most interesting things when it comes to genre is, so one of our biggest uh, success stories of late um, in the last couple of months, uh, actually, sorry, late last year, is a musician called David, D4VD. Today, he's signed to Dark Room uh, and in a partnership with Interscope. 
Uh, so Billie Eilish's label Darkroom, as well as Interscope Records under Universal Music Group, and has seen tremendous success. And he really is interesting in that he's genre defying. He, we don't see him necessarily as one specific genre. Some people have seen him as indie pop, goth rock. I mean, there are many different aspects of what they do, but I think what's very, very exciting about the younger generation and the new generation of creators is they aren't, because they create so much, they aren't really defined by fixed genres. Although if we look at categorization, 60% of band lab is hip hop and rap. And I think that largely trends with, with global statistics. Um, it depends obviously from country to country. I think some of that is indexed in the fact that we have such a large US audience and then a global audience for which using your mobile phone, your microphone and your voice is still your primary instrument versus let's say if you know we were a guitar surface driven mm -hmm. app, you'd expect guitar music to be more heavily indexed, right? Um, mm. But I think when it comes to the younger generation, it does seem, A, that the boundaries of genre don't necessarily defy them and, uh, define them anymore, and they're willing to try pretty much anything. And someone like David has seen huge success in songs from all around the spectrum, but then we have very exciting talent like La Tyler, L-U-H-T-Y-L-E-R, who is signed under Atlantic Records in the US, incredibly talented kid out of Tallahassee, Florida. Um, and he's a rapper and just doing incredible things at a very, very young age. Hmm. Now, do, do you find these success stories staying with BandLab in the sense that they, that they keep creating in this ecosystem when they are signed to Universal or to a Warner Brothers or whoever it may be? Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I you know, in, in the words of the artists uh, themselves, you know, someone like like David, he just released his EP uh, a couple of weeks ago. Sorry, at the end of May, and his his post was about the fact that BandLab was was where he actually recorded his tracks. I mean, today on Spotify, he is close to 30 million monthly listeners, over a billion plays. I think 1.2 billion plays on Spotify alone on the tracks he made on a mobile phone in his sister's closet on BandLab. Right? Um, I think that's. A, an incredible story, um, one, especially for someone who didn't actually intend to become a musician in the first place. He actually wanted to be a professional gamer, but then was putting up clips of himself playing Fortnite and then found that all his stuff was getting taken down because of copyright strikes. So he told his mom about it and, and she's an incredible woman. She said to him, you know, you should just go make your own music. Stop complaining about it. Stop crying about it. Go make your own music. And then he's discovered making music through BandLab and now he has a music career and has changed the lives of not just himself, but his family, and inspired so many, so many musicians uh, and, and creators around the world through what he's been able to do. So despite him ac having access to the best studios in the world, at the end of the day, outside of BandLab, there are no real tools or software for someone to be easily able to capture inspiration on the go through their mobile devices. And so whether or not you have access to great studios and great producers and great equipment. We believe this is the rising tide that lifts all ships. And it actually allows more people to appreciate why studios are necessary, right? If you think about the rise of short form music and the fact that there are even more bits of atomized songs out in the world, there are more people than ever before that need to finish songs and record them well. So mm. I'm kind of biased because I also sell all the equipment that people buy in studios. Of course you do. <laughs> But I do believe that from our personal knowledge as well, a lot of the people buying more expensive guitars aren't necessarily 13, 14, 15 year old kids buying their first guitar. It's very much people who 20 years ago loved playing guitar and finally have the means to actually invest and pick up a new hobby or get back into something they loved in the past. And we're so excited by not just the whole generation of users today who are now able to appreciate and need to work with great producers around the world, but also hopefully in 10, 15 years time, the number of people who actually would then go to the next level and use other products and, and take their recording, um, you know, and, and be empowered in that way, we think is only gonna be, only gonna be creatively, incredibly meaningful in, in, in the sort of musicality of the world as a whole. And, and if, if we look at, at, at all of the businesses that you're invested in, you, you own um, or are invested in so much of that value chain. Obviously, yeah, let's touch on NME for, for a second. As you say, you know, it's an institution. Um, why buy the likes of an NME? Um, 
I can I can kind of assume why. Um, but um, let us know the inspiration in buying up and and being a part of the the value chain that you own. So so I, I look. I think part of ownership is not just. Uh, it's really about the responsibility and the vision of what you can do with it. And we believe that there are incredible institutions like the NME um, that were built out of a different time in the market. There's a reason why Southeast Asia, we were obviously owners of Rolling Stone from 2016 to 2019, incredible brand as well that I have a great fondness for, despite being biased because NME was my very first magazine in the UK um, when I was growing mm. up there as a kid. But there's a reason why there aren't Rolling Stones and enemies of Southeast Asia or other territories like that is because the music industry had fundamentally shift by the shifted by the time these countries were emerging. And so with that in mind, when you think about emerging talent and supporting emerging talent and the entire life cycle of users all the way through, being able to support artists and telling their stories, especially in a world today where there is so much music and more than ever before, Today, distribution mm. is not the problem. Differentiation is the problem. And if you're really, really um, you know, committed to bridging that gap between emerging and helping people on their journey, whether it's supporting them with musical instruments, helping them if they have a vision of becoming an artist to tell their story differently, especially when you think about the billions of people around the world that don't live in first world countries or the traditional markets that were seen as the biggest in the world for music, there is a massive gap that needs support from the institutions to be able to help them through. And so with the NME, it's a, you know, some of that comes to life in the decisions we've made. Um, we announced last month, and David incidentally was the very first cover because we think of him as the emerging, uh, the leader of the next wave of emerging artists and the new generation of musicians. Every single cover of the NME, you know, which has had the most incredible musicians since 1952, all the future covers on a weekly basis are now emerging artists and only emerging artists. And yes, this I've is about that. our commitment to, to uh, talent, but also telling stories where the cover of the enemy is no longer limited to just people in the US or the UK or countries that where you sell a newsstand have to have someone on the cover that's gonna sell copies. We believe that in our environment, in our ecosystem, we have the ability to make better editorial decisions and actually support emerging talent because they're amazing, as opposed to just because it sells more magazines on a newsstand, right? Yeah, yeah. The likes of a, a Universal and uh, and the majors, um, do they do they see you as a threat? No, I, we, we've got incredible relationships with with them, and I think again, we're unique as a platform. Whether it's the fact that already you know, we've got a great history of telling stories and supporting the artists and the differentiation of their artists um, through NME or the equipment that we sell or the guitars that we manufacture under Vista Musical Instruments. Um, we own Harmony Guitars, Heritage Guitars. Harmony Guitars was, Stairway to Heaven was written in Harmony. Bob, D Bob Dylan's first guitar was built by Harmony in Chicago. Um, and incredible stories of how we support artists throughout the entire value chain. But when it comes to BandLab, as a tech platform and as a music tech platform, what's different to most music tech platforms that have come up in the last couple of years is their relationship with an artist have largely been based on empowering indies and their relationship mm. with artists generally end when they get signed. Whereas mm. someone like David or Le Tyler or, or as an incredible artist also under a uh, universal called Lil Hero, um, she's incredibly talented in releasing some music soon. Um, they still need to make music whether they're independent or signed. So the minute they get signed, they're now an incredible story that we're so proud of as a platform because we want to help people get to a certain level, but we know that people need support to get to the next level. BandLab is a platform. Mm -hmm. Some people can succeed by just doing everything themselves, but as everybody knows, you know, there's a difference between a freelancer and a gig economy and an employee. Some people need health benefits. Some people need a support structure to get the most out of what they do. Some people can be solo players. They can be solo tennis players. Some people need a team and, 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 and prefer to play in a team sport. And I think every musician is different. Every musician is sort of a small business. And so we're extremely supportive of moving people into the label structure because we know that as a platform, there's almost so much, there's only so much we can do for people. But what's unique about us is that whether you're whether you're signed or whether you're independent, you still need to make music. 
And that's something where our relationship doesn't stop. In fact, it only grows because there are more things we need to do now to try and support them as they go to the next level of their journey. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you you touch on a, you know, on a, on a critical point is education, because I think there's, there's still to this day, um, you know, this, this understanding that if I create this, this, what I assume to be a great piece of music, that weirdly, that's where my job's ends as a musician whereas um the most successful musicians independent or majors are the ones who who understand the business that they're in and 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 do the heavy lifting all the way through to that chart success and they don't kind of just assume that the song is going to do it for them yeah it's interesting i think particularly on the independent level the idea that you can't just make music anymore and you need to effectively be the videographer, the social media specialist, the uh, the CEO of the company. Um, we so we sort of think about it this way that, and that's the value of these institutional institutions like labels or management companies that can really support artists at, at at different stages of their career. Again, every artist is different, and depending on your genre, depending on you know the amount of creative control or even business control you want around your decisions, it it it, it changes from artist to artist. But to your point. Not everyone wants to be a CEO and taking every responsibility in a business to use that analogy. Some people just want to be the creative director and have a great marketing team and have a CEO and contribute in that way creatively and not necessarily have to handle all the other bits. And I think that's one of the beauties of the system that we're in now is that you can make that choice. No longer is that only one route. And what personally I disagree with is the idea that people saying you have to take one route, you have to stay independent or you have to get signed. I think it's very, 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 um, uh, uh, you know, it depends on the artist very much. It depends on them, their support system, whether their family or their friends or their, their, their business acumen. It's very different from artist to artist, but fundamentally, obviously they need to be incredibly talented and have musicality. Otherwise, you know, the core product itself um, wouldn't be appealing to uh, the consumer base. Absolutely. Let's let's go back to obviously this this ecosystem that you um, that that you own um, in in obviously in in throughout that value chain um, and the influence of AI. Obviously, you know, you talk about supporting uh, artists and promoting artists and and having BandLab in particular be at that platform to do that. And, how, how much of that is informed by the algorithm in the sense of when, you know, when music is ingested into BandLab? Take us through how you look to support the actual creation uh, or the actual product that's been created in order for it to be heard by as many people as possible. Yeah. So, you know, what we're very, very focused on is obviously the creation process. And a lot of that is empowering people with all the tools, whether it's BandLab Sounds, whether it's BandLab Mastering, BandLab FX, and, and the whole studio that allows people to make their content. Um, once the content is made, we obviously believe that there is there are a lot of platforms out there for people to get heard. And, and what we build on BandLab itself is more of the social community and the social network functions. Um, and that actually is where, again, from an algorithm based or a pure, you know, throw this up and hope that it goes viral. We don't think we're the platform for that, nor do we want to be the platform for that. There are great platforms out there, whether it's YouTube Shorts, TikTok, Instagram Reels, um, and other places for distributing your music, whether it's Spotify, SoundCloud, et cetera, where people can actually put their music up to get it listened to. What we're very focused on is fandom and interactions with an artist. And that's where there are two things we do. We build both the product features for artists to be able to express more about themselves than just sharing their music. And we also build the community in a way that allows people to engage and have a focused place for music, which to be honest, hasn't really exist since MySpace. Um, it's been nearly, you know, it's been over a decade since the last time there was actually a music focused social network. Um, and that's because largely the main social networks are the first generation social networks have graduated and having to become everything to everybody and are really social media companies. They're more TV channels than they really are communities. And in a world of so much content, differentiation also comes from the people around you. You know, Jason, what you care about or the most exciting artists to you or even the artists that I've mentioned now, they'll mean something different to you just because we have a personal relationship now and I've mentioned their names. 
right? Um, so I think in a world where you can't just listen to everything that's released anymore and there are only you know five, six, seven albums being dropped on a monthly basis, you can't listen mm. to everything. Therefore, how you make sense of the noise is really core and that comes through personal relationships, interactions and community more than just passive listening. So at BandLab, we're very, very focused on the idea that passive listening isn't it. Passive listening can get you a record deal, can get you, you know, a, a viral hit and people to know about who you are, but, but active fans can give you a career. And that's where we're mm -hmm. really focused on that fandom. We'd rather have somebody with 10,000 plays with 100 monthly listeners than a million plays a month and a million monthly listeners, because that means you just listen to the track once a month. Is that a real fan? I, I, I don't think that's necessarily what's going to propel you to a career or a 20, 30, 40 year career that could be sustainable for you pursuing your creative dreams. Mm, mm, mm. And since 2015 to now, who would you say is your biggest success besides the names that you cited more recently? I think, uh, you know, one of the ones that I'm incredibly proud of, I mean, the, the ones that I mentioned and, and the ones that we're seeing um, from Kid Ace at APG uh, to to a lot of the users on the platform. There's an incredible artist we just featured on Lab FM, which is our uh, our sort of in-house media editorial to actually promote band lab artists and stories from all around the regions. Um, uh, artist called Nefertiti Gold. She's really, really talented vocalist. Um, but some of the really exciting stories have come from before as well. And the ones who have seen that success and keep hustling. There's a kid out of Houston, Texas called Clappers, C-L-4-P-E-R-S. Um, that's incredibly talented and and is is constantly making music um, on a daily basis and, and just an incredibly talented young artist. Um, but I, I Again, it's very hard to pinpoint. I think everyone's at different stages of their journey. What we're really motivated by is the fact that today, the success stories that I'm excited by haven't even happened yet, right? And that's actually why I, I was very, very uh, keen to spend more time in, in Cape Town. And, and unfortunately, I couldn't be there because the fact of the matter is the talent that is outside the traditional channels and the, the traditional markets that are served that have generally been ignored because they use Android and they don't, they aren't perceived to have the same spending power just because you don't have the same social economic status as someone else in a first world country does not mean you are less musical or less talented. Mm -hmm. In okay. fact, you might be even more committed to your creativity. And, you know, in, in places like South Africa, there's incredible talent out of townships and you, you can see that through the stories and, and, you know, existing publications and, and uh, local radio and things like that but no one on a global mm. basis necessarily knows about this. And there aren't the channels that come through because they are underserved with tools and underserved with the right voices like publications who would be able to bring them to a wider audience. So, you know, to answer your question, not in a sort of a, a cheeky way, but the stories that I'm most excited by, I believe haven't happened yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And as you say, and I think, you know, the, the world certainly for a number of years now has this curiosity around Africa. I think that's always been the case, but I think more popularly, um, more, more, more recently with I'm a piano and, and, and genres like that coming through that, uh, you know, th that the world is looking, but they kind of haven't figured out what to do with it. I think the UK has done a better job yep. at being able to integrate, um, certainly, uh, the, the, the South African artists that are coming through, um, and are being heard and are playing the likes of Glastonbury, um, which is phenomenal because 10 years ago that wouldn't have happened. But, um, you know, for, for, you know, for, for, a, you know for, for, for the likes of a band lab coming into a territory like South Africa and looking to try and understand the space, which is very different from Southeast Asia or North America or uh, Europe or the UK, um, that must be fascinating for you to be able to be able to try and adopt the, the the creatives in this space um, and perhaps talk to them slightly differently than you would in the rest of the world. Yeah, I, I think I think for most platforms in the music industry, because they come from a consumption side, you know exactly what you said is is kind of the biggest issue. How do they truly understand local market beyond just the idea of what people 
know of it as the cultural export, right? How can you build that local understanding in a world of where there's broadcasting versus narrow casting? And, and today we're very much in a world of, you know, whether it's TikTok and Instagram reels or YouTube shorts, personalized TV channels effectively for everybody, the same thing that happens with music. And that's why consumption finds it very hard to make sense of it. However, for us, in a way, we believe that before you can even consume, there needs to be content. And today, the trends of Africa versus Southeast Asia are the same. Everyone is mobile first. And everybody, if you think about the demographics, again, don't have the tools simply because the market share of places like Android are, are, are significantly bigger than iPhone. So this is a massive opportunity where our, what we want to do in the market is not really is not really exploited from a consumption perspective. It's much more about empowering it because we believe that today it is being ignored. So when mm. we come into the market, we get that immediate relevance and, and, and that growth because firstly, we are, we are providing the tools for people to actually finally get their voice out there, right? Mm. Just if you think about this outside of BandLab today, BandLab disappeared in 2023. There is no tool on a mobile phone or a, a Google Pixel or a Samsung device that you could actually sit there and even record a vocal harmony on a mobile device if you have an idea or you want to record a multi-track uh, uh, you know, song with some guitar and some vocals on top. There's nothing you could use. So mm. you know, that relevance is inherent in a way because it's actually, when we're not the platform, it's the artists that are the platform. We're just a tool mm. that supports them in their journey. What what I find interesting, you know, as we as we look to wrap this up, uh, Ming, because I realise that uh, we're forty minutes in. So um, <laughs> thank you again for for that. But uh, the one concern is obviously that if so much music has been created, more music than ever before in the history of music, um, there's this point of saturation, right? There's this point of every time an artist creates something, you know, on your platform that the arguably creating more noise so you know cutting through all of that and making sure that yes you're you're creating a, a fantastic platform for creatives to 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 be exactly that but you are now making it even more competitive you know i mean everyone knows the stats that you know spotify is uploading you know in excess of a hundred thousand tracks a day etc cetera, etc cetera. um how how would you well, I suppose, what advice would you give a, an artist who's, you know, who signs up to BandLab and gets going? Because it's a very busy marketplace. It's a incredibly, because of the, the, the democratization that you've created, um, it, it's weirdly become even more competitive because there's just more people able to do it. Yes. So, so I, I, I sort of say that although we are part of the problem, I also believe that, you know, we're very, very motivated to be part of the solution, right? And we believe that yes. the biggest challenge today with most of the, the streaming service or the consumption side, so I would kind of position it as creation is now finally catching up, right? Thanks to platforms mm -hmm. like BandLab, it's finally catching up. However, consumption hasn't necessarily caught up. In fact, all it's driving towards is more passive consumption. And that's not the yeah. same as really building strong active fan groups. So there are two things we say to this. One is we do believe that it's a responsibility of the consumption platforms to actually catch up, to support with discovery as opposed to just letting everything sort of echo and reverberate in an echo chamber until you know something comes out as the winner. And you know, where we're putting out where our money putting our money where our mouth is and actually investing and being part of the solution is that's why the community aspect is so important for us. Because when you think about the world of broadcasting and success of artists, right? This is one of the biggest challenges for the industry of how they make sense of what success means and, and size of success. There will always be people at the very top of the pyramid with millions and millions of, of fans around the world. However, it only, you know, as you know from, from theory, you only need 100 to 1,000 core fans who are really, really, really pa you know, passionate about what you do and willing to spend and bring that share of wallet to the experiences you bring to them. And you need that in a world of billions of people. It's actually more possible than ever, to, ever before to have sustainable micro communities supporting artists on a global scale with all the different permutations of small communities and fan communities. And it is possible, however, 
the platforms, the space for it to be built. You know, where is the community that you can go to in the same way? If you want to build a professional persona or a professional community, you can go to LinkedIn. If you want a fitness one, you can go to Strava. That's what we're building with BandLab. And that's where we believe, you know, building that safe space and that network where people can actually have those communities and build that fandom in a place that's actually about music. This is where, you know, I, I believe that solution is key because if you're a musician today and releasing music to Spotify, it's not just about the stuff that's being released around you. You're competing with Ed Sheeran, you're competing with Taylor Swift, you're competing with the Rolling Stones, the Who, and all the best, you know, Charlie Christian, B.B. King, the best artists of not just today, but every generation before. And that's actually much harder than competing against your own environment. It's, it's you know, you're competing against people who have years, decades of, of infrastructure and success to support them in a way that that emerging artists doesn't have. And that's kind of, again, a very key point of the BandLab community and our focus around ensuring that, to your point, success for us is more people's content being heard and building retained, recurring fan engagement more so than who's got the biggest hit and who's got the biggest track. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say those things aren't important and and you know but we believe we aren't necessarily the platform for that we believe that this is a collaborative environment where there are platforms to be broadcast and to create that viral success but we really care about you know just like we do as a company sustainable recurring success is much more important for the masses because you know just one hit does not make a community you need everybody to be in the same journey and 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 feel that they can relate to each other in that way i mean again in closing you you make a a really interesting point is that you know typically any artist or, or band is looking for global success whereas what what you are advocating is almost keep it local you know keep your community you know basically fish where the fish are um because the likelihood of you beating ed sheeran you know or taylor swift Yes, highly unlikely in the greatest scheme of things. But what you're saying is that there are there are audiences, communities locally, and I, and I use the term loosely, uh, within a digital reality that um, can sustain you um, without you having to be the next Taylor Swift or the next Ed Sheeran. Well, I, I, look, I think whether you're Taylor Swift or Ed Sheeran, everyone built their first 100 fans, right? And I think yeah. the, the best yeah. advice that, that I would give to anybody coming up is still just like any business, who is your core fan base? Who is your core, you know, what's your core product market fit? What's your core fan base? And you need to build that properly. Um, to the point about not being global, actually, I, I would say not, you are building global, but I think the idea is you have to think about it more slow and steady versus thinking that just being big overnight is a con equal success, right? Um, yes. And so you can build a global community, but the idea is that you want to build a community that's local to you, that could be global, but really local to you and actually cares about you in the same way a local community would care about you because they have that relationship with you. I mean, what does local mean? It means that you come from the same neighborhood or you relate in a way bigger than just some property or identity that you have, right? Um, and I think when it comes to music, that's really where you can have a global audience, but a global audience that's someone from... Portugal and Cape Town and Malaysia can still feel as connected to the artist thanks to digital than ever before. And that's the possibility of creating that proximity to artists, but still potentially in a global way and, and thinking that, hey, you still need to build your hundred first fans, your first thousand fans and treat them really well and make sure they feel like family, like your local neighbors in your local town. And that's how you can build a recurring you know, fan base that will support you hopefully to maybe millions in the future, but but everyone, Taylor Swift included, started with just a hundred, <laughs> right? First fan. True, and I think it, um, it's, it's, it, it, it's based on respect, um, both, both from, the, from, the, from the artist and the audience. So, um, Meng, we could talk for days, um, but I, I, I realize that your time is at a premium. Um, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure to spend time with you today, and uh, we do look forward to welcoming you, uh, wel welcoming you back to Cape Town. You were here a couple of months ago, so you are no stranger to this country, and we look forward to uh, your influence and Band Lab's uh, input in particular uh, in our creative process. So thank you. I appreciate it. Really appreciate it, Jason. And, and yeah, look forward to seeing you and meeting you in person soon in the future.